Welcome to Clinical Minute. Zoe is an 18-year-old woman, Gravita 1, Para 0, presenting for an IUD insertion. She was referred to you because she has a stenotic cervix and another provider was unable to complete an IUD insertion. From reviewing her chart, you know that she is in generally good health. Her last menstrual period began five days ago. A beta HCG pregnancy test today was negative. Knowing that she had previous unpleasant experience, you choose to meet with her first in your office. You start by asking her how you can help her today. She says that she would like to get an IUD. She did try to get one a couple of months ago, but the doctor told her that she had a problem with her cervix, something that started with an S, and it hurt a lot when he tried to insert it. You empathize with her, saying that it sounds like she had a tough experience. You ask her if the doctor said that she has stenosis, to which she replies, yes, that's it. How do you proceed with Zoe? You also know that LARC methods, including intrauterine contraception, or IUC, are considered top-tier methods because less than one pregnancy per 100 women occurs in a year with the use of these methods. IUC is more effective in preventing pregnancy than the second-tier methods, not due to their mechanisms of action, but because they are easier to use properly. Once the top-tier methods are initiated, they require little additional action to provide highly effective contraception. Further, in the Contraceptive Choice Project study, 9,256 women ages 14 to 45 were counseled about all methods of contraception. More than 40% of women ages 18 to 20 chose intrauterine contraception, or IUC. Among the women who selected IUC, 84% who chose the Copper T IUD and 88% who selected the LNG-52 IUS, Mirena, were still using the method at one year. At three years, the continuation rate for the LNG IUD was 69.8%, and for the Copper T IUD was 69.7%. All in all, IUC has the highest satisfaction rate of all contraceptive methods. You also know that despite an excellent record of patient satisfaction, intrauterine contraception is an underused method in the United States. Reasons for underuse include lack of awareness of the method among women, myths about IUC safety, negative publicity about older methods, misconceptions among providers and public, upfront cost for patient and for provider, to keep in stock to cover training costs. Concern that reimbursement will not sufficiently cover services or time, including time for training. Lack of positive marketing. Fear among providers of litigation. You are aware that there are many myths about IUDs. You recently watched an Association of Reproductive Health Professionals webinar that addressed and dispelled several myths about intrauterine contraception. IUDs are not abortifacients and are not large in size. They do not cause or increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. IUDs do not cause pelvic infections or decrease the likelihood of future pregnancies. In addition, they do not need to be removed in case of pelvic inflammatory disease or inflammatory changes on a pap test. IUDs can be used by women who had an ectopic pregnancy, can be inserted the same day, can be started immediately postpartum or post-abortion, and can be used by nulliparous women. Furthermore, you know that the timing of IUD insertion is very flexible. An IUD can be inserted immediately postpartum or post-abortion. IUDs can be inserted at any time during the menstrual cycle as long as the provider is reasonably certain that the woman is not pregnant. The practice of inserting an IUD only during menses is unnecessary and inconvenient for the patient. You also know that insertion instructions vary by specific product, but that general steps are to 
1. Perform pelvic exam to assess size and position of uterus. 2. Apply speculum, antiseptic, and tenaculum. 3. Sound the uterus. 4. Load the device. 5. Place the device. 6. Cut the strings. 7. Add documentation to patient's chart, including string length, uterine device, and lot number. You also have a few evidence-based options for pain management, modification of insertion technique, and relaxation strategies to help Zoe through the insertion process. With all of this in mind, you tell Zoe that having stenosis means that the opening of her cervix is narrower than most. Stenosis can make it a bit more challenging to insert an IUD, but that you have successfully inserted IUDs for many women with cervical stenosis. Because she's already chosen a method of contraception, you don't go through your usual process of patient-centered counseling and shared decision-making. However, you do want to at least check in about how she decided on an IUD. You ask, can you tell me how you decided that an IUD was the right method for you? Zoe replies that she got pregnant accidentally a few months ago and ended up having an abortion because she knew she wasn't ready for a baby. She wanted something that would keep her from getting pregnant until she was at least 25. Also, she has tried a bunch of different birth control methods with hormones in them, but they always had side effects, like nausea or making her breasts hurt. The last doctor said that the IUD with copper on it might be a good choice for her because it doesn't use any hormones. You take the opportunity to show her a picture of the copper tea and review a few key facts. The copper tea intrauterine device, IUD, is a small T-shaped device made of plastic wrapped with copper. The copper tea IUD is approved for up to 10 years of use but it can be removed earlier if a woman decides she wants to get pregnant. The copper tea is thought to work by preventing fertilization, preventing the egg and the sperm from meeting up. Some women who use the copper tea experience changes in menstrual flow. It starts working immediately, so no backup birth control is needed. However, the copper tea doesn't provide protection from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. Condoms can be used with an IUD to prevent STIs, including HIV. Complications are rare and include perforation, infection, and dislocation. You ask Zoe if she has any questions. She says that she doesn't. Because you want to do everything you can to ensure a successful insertion this time, you think it is important to find out more about what happened with the last insertion attempt. You ask her to tell you more about what happened the last time she tried to get an IUD. She said that it started to hurt, and she tensed up and just couldn't relax. Once again, you empathize with her, saying that you're sorry to hear that she had a tough time last time, and go on to reassure her that there are several things that you can do to help her manage the pain and to relax. You explain that some of the things that have worked well for other patients with cervical stenosis are helping the opening of the cervix stretch more easily by using a medication called misoprostol, either the night before or a few hours before insertion, taking an NSAID like ibuprofen before the insertion, using a topical anesthetic to numb the cervix before the insertion. You ask her, what are your thoughts? She says that she'd like to use all of the available options so that she doesn't have a repeat of last time. You tell her that's fine and go on to say that you'd also like to show her a technique that can help her keep from fainting before the insertion. Tense muscles in arms, legs, and trunk for 10 to 15 seconds. Hold the tension until experiencing a warm sensation in the head. Relax for 20 to 30 seconds. Repeat five times. You practice the technique together. You also show her and have her practice a breathing technique, focusing on breathing in slowly through her nose and out slowly through her mouth to help her stay relaxed during the insertion. 
You check the schedule and see that there's an afternoon appointment later that week. You go through the informed consent process with Zoe, making sure to cover possible complications in more detail, that she should return to the office or go to the emergency room if she cannot feel the threads or the threads feel much longer, is able to feel part of the IUD besides the threads, has severe cramping, or has severe bleeding. That she can use an over-the-counter NSAID, like ibuprofen, for mild to moderate cramping, and that you will want to see her again for a follow-up appointment three to six weeks after insertion. She signs the informed consent form, and you give her detailed written information about aftercare and warning signs to take with her. You give her a prescription for misoprostol, 400 micrograms, and explain that she will insert into her vagina four hours before the appointment. Ask her to practice her relaxation and breathing, and tell her that you'll see her later this week. When Zoe returns for her insertion appointment, you greet her and check in on how she's feeling. She says she's a little nervous. You tell her that being nervous is normal and that you'll do everything you can to help her stay calm and relaxed. You check to make sure that she inserted the misoprostol and give her NSAIDs 400 milligrams. Most clinicians use 600 to 800 milligrams for this and advise it to be taken one to two hours before the insertion to take orally. You have Zoe use the relaxation technique and remind her to keep breathing slowly in through her nose and out through her mouth. You establish the size and position of the uterus by pelvic exam. You insert a wide speculum to better visualize the cervix and cleanse the vagina and cervix with an antiseptic solution. You apply a tenaculum to the cervix to align the cervical canal with the uterine cavity. Because Zoe has a stenotic cervix, you choose to use an endometrial sampler instead of a sound to measure the depth of the uterus. In addition, you decide to instill 1 cc of 2% lidocaine to the uterine cavity with an endometrial sampler while advancing to the fundus. You know that if resistance is encountered while attempting advancement of the sampler through the internal os, graduated dilators can gently widen the stenotic region to allow comfortable passage of the sounding device. However, you find that you don't need to use dilators in this case. Using a septic technique, you load Paragard into the insertion tube by folding the two horizontal arms against the stem and pushing the tips of the arms securely alongside the inserter tube. You bring your thumb and index finger closer together to continue bending the arms until they are alongside the stem. You use your other hand to withdraw the insertion tube just enough so that it can be pushed and rotated onto the tips of the arms keeping in mind that your goal is to secure the tips of the arms inside the tube and inserting the arms no further than necessary to ensure retention. Then you introduce the solid white rod into the insertion tube from the bottom, alongside the threads, until it touches the bottom of the paragard. You're careful to keep your finger on the top of the device while bringing the white rod up to touch the lower portion of the IUD. You grasp the insertion tube at the open end of the package and adjust the blue flange so that the distance from the top of the paragard, where it protrudes from the inserter, to the blue flange is the same as the uterine depth that you measured with the sounding device. You rotate the insertion tube so that the horizontal arms of the IUD and long axis of the blue flange lie in the same horizontal plane. You pass the loaded insertion tube through the cervical canal until Paragard just touches the fundus, the blue flange at the cervix in the horizontal plane. To release the arms of Paragard high in the uterine fundus, you hold the solid white rod steady and withdraw the insertion tube no more than one centimeter. You gently and carefully move the insertion tube upward toward the top of the uterus until slight resistance is felt. You hold the insertion tube steady and withdraw the solid white rod. You gently and slowly withdraw the insertion tube from the cervical canal. You trim the threads 
so that three centimeters protrude from the cervix into the vagina. As you work, you talk Zoe through what you're doing throughout the insertion, checking in with her periodically and reminding her to breathe. She makes it through the insertion with flying colors and tells you it was easier than she expected. As she leaves, you remind her that you'd like to see her for a follow-up appointment in three to six weeks, and you document details, including string length, in her medical record.